So welcome everybody to uh, our panel session today about how Ospos can help catapult Ireland into open source. I'm delighted to be joined here today with our fantastic panelists. We're all, most of us are coming to you from Ireland. Some of us are coming to you from um, the United States, but we're all here to talk about the experience of Ireland and open source. Um, so if I could introduce our wonderful panelists. With us here today is Brian Fitzgerald, who's the director of Lero, Ireland's Software Research Centre. We have Gar McCreesta, who is the product manager for Ireland's COVID tracker app um, and works with the health service executive, which is Ireland's health uh, service. We have uh, Tim Willoughby, who is the head of digital services and innovation with Ongarda Siakana, which is Ireland's police service. And we have Denise Cooper, who is a long time open source advocate, but who also works with Nearform in Ireland, um, who were also involved in the development of Ireland's COVID tracker app. So welcome all, nice to have you here. Um, and we're here today to talk about Ireland and open source. And I suppose it might be a good idea to start with maybe going over a little bit of Ireland's history with open source. We're not really known to be, uh, you know, a nation that is, you know, top of mind when it comes to open source. But Brian, I know you've shared that we have had lots of individual contributors who've made amazing contributions to open source. Perhaps you can give us a little bit of an overview of, of who they are. Sure, delighted to, uh, Claire, a good opportunity. So we've had a long record of significant contribution, and I'll just name some of the people here very briefly. Uh, Justin Mason, who created Apache Spam Assassin, which protects 100 million users. Kina Marjean, who founded Nearform, which Denise is going to talk about later. Uh, they, I think, commit about 25% of all commits to Node.js, so significant. Uh, Kayla McNamara, who now works at Red Hat, was the person who reverse engineered the Microsoft document format, which paved the way for Star Office and Open Office. Uh, Dave Early authored PAM SMB, which allowed Unix machines to authenticate to a Windows NT domain. Mel Gorman wrote the first VQF dec decoder for Linux back in 1998. Uh, Tony, and on the commercial side then, Tony Kenny, I think, well, back in 2002, moved Bowman Hospital to an entirely open source suite of admin and hospital administration systems, uh, very much an uphill struggle. And Hans-Jürgen Kugler uh, was uh, instrumental in trying to persuade Mercedes that they should use, think, think about using open source. He was told he should check himself into a mental hospital. Now uh, <laughs> Mercedes have a very sophisticated open source program. I think the moral of the story from those practical examples is that we were ahead of our time uh, in that people weren't ready for open source and there was a lot of really yeah. good stuff, hard to sell it, much easier nowadays. So we were probably 15 years ahead of our time. And you yourself, Brian, you've been involved in the open source community for a good number of years. Sure, yes. Yeah. So I first heard about it in 1998, late 1998, on a seminar that my friend Joe Feller gave uh, and he was giving it to students. None of them were interested. I was extremely interested and gave up research and everything else for the next 20 years. And we did a lot of uh, early publications that are very well cited. Uh, we founded the IFA Working Group on Open Source Software. We had workshops at the International Conference of Software Engineering from 2001 to 2005. We founded the International Conference of Software Engineering, which has been running since 2006. Uh, and we ran the Shonen School, I think, in Open Source Software in 2017. And most recently, Klaas-Jan Stoll, who was uh, very active in this area, did his PhD in Lero. He and Denise worked on the definitive book and inner source, which is really popular. So lots of stuff going on in, uh, in research as well. And I think it's, so it's probably noteworthy that we've had so many individuals and organizations in Ireland participate in this way, but perhaps we're just not coordinating that effort in a way to actually help people know about it. And I know that Tim, uh, you're, you've had a lot of experience from a public sector perspective in Ireland within open source. Perhaps you can comment about what's been happening there for the last number of years. Yeah, thanks very much. I suppose yeah, I started my life out in the local government sector and uh, I suppose in, in 2006, 2007, it became very obvious there wasn't gonna be as much capital to spend in IT. So we started looking at, initially started looking at cheaper open source alternatives and we went for an awful lot of community-based products because that was all that we had the capital to do. And I suppose since then, we, I think my view is open source is again, not, not dissimilar to innovation, it's all about doing things. 
So we did a whole load of different projects with Alfresco, Elastic, Sugar, Red Hat. And again, we were probably early using quite a lot of them. And um, I know I, I can't talk about open source in public sector without mentioning, you know, Dr. Mihai Baduka, who was in Limerick City and County Council, or Liam Stewart in the Office of the Public Works, or, you know, Revenue, John Barron. And obviously, Tony Kenny has been mentioned before. But, you know, there's certainly, there's an awful lot of stuff happening. And I think part of it is just telling people what, other, what you're doing. And I, now I work in the Irish Police, so we're using Alfresco, Elastic, Sugar, Red Hat, a huge amount of Android and open development structures, open architecture. So yeah, it, it's, again, it's just following the natural curve of where the world is going with open source is, it's, it's evolving and we're able to harness the power of it. And I think what's interesting, when I've heard the story about what you're doing with Angarda Shiakana as well, you've also been involved in some international collaborations on the back of that open work. Uh, perhaps you can comment about the potential around that. Yeah, we've had a number of hackathons with the uh, Dutch, the Danish and the Swedish police. And again, that was part, initially it was a meeting of minds that we needed to look at more open architectures, open technologies in lead, so we could share stuff. So the more proprietary we became, the less we're able to share. So we agreed some open architectures and open standards. And now after we had a hackathon last year then where we started to evolve the sharing and we're sharing apps with each other because we're able to develop on the same platforms. And again, we may not ever, these apps may not ever become on public shareable sites for the, because they're quite secure in their nature, but it is still a group of different international police forces working together in, with absolutely, I suppose, inner source rather than open source. That's it. Yeah, no, it's, and, and, and it is important to, for, for those of you who are not familiar with inner source, it's the application of open source methods inside firewalls, um, which has proven to create great collaboration. So yeah, thank you. And, and thanks for your work there. And Gar, you've been involved in probably Ireland's most recent open source success. So uh, perhaps you can give us some background about uh, the COVID tracker app and why you chose to move down an open source route with that. So um, I guess a quick bit of background. So I work for the health service executive and in conjunction, so the health service executive in conjunction with Angar the Shea Khan of the Irish Police Force, Department of Public Expenditure uh, and the Department of Health, Central Statistics Office and others and Defence Forces Ireland um, all work collaboratively with uh, private sector partners, Neuroform, Amazon and a bunch of others to bring this app together. And at the beginning, I, I, I I think I've told this story before where it, we didn't know it was going to be an app. It turned out to be an app. It seems obvious now that it was, but the app itself, due to the nature of it, and given that this is a population scale response to a pandemic, then the transparency, privacy were top of mind for a lot of people. So as we were going through that process of trying to understand not alone how we would build it, but how we would get a large proportion of our population to adopt it and trust it, then it became critical for us to be open and transparent about how we were doing that. So open source became kind of the natural evolution of that. So there were demands immediately from privacy rights and civil liberties people to say, yeah, we want to see it. Um, but in our heads, that this is the direction of travel that we were going. It was the only way that we could truly make it open. So a lot of what we did was done in that spirit, and, but it was done in that way with the driver being transparency in the first instance. And it was really around that. And that was to build trust through that. And I think that, the follow on from this then was that once we had opened it and actually prior to us uh, publishing into the Linux Foundation Public Health Project, uh, we'd open sourced it separately. So we set up the first GitHub um, HSC Ireland organization on GitHub and it was the first GitHub project that the HSC had done. Uh, and there's, so I think there's, there's a bit here at the beginning of understanding what's involved in actually open sourcing it because it's not as simple as here's the code, publish. It's, there's more thinking to be done. And I think that's where for organizations like the HSE where things like InnerSource can work. So it kind of fits because it's kind of that, here's the toolkit, here's the step-by-step, -step, here's the stuff you don't know about this thing that you don't, you've heard about, but don't really understand how it works. So then the, the subsequent piece of that was um, publishing it into the Linux Foundation Public Health Project, which again, ratcheted it up a notch, both in terms of uh, just the overall community that could support it, but also the scope of this. So it went from being us sharing it with Northern Ireland and because we share with Northern Ireland, we share with Scotland quite regularly and it's not done in the context of it being open source. It's done as a, a sharing, a peer to peer sharing thing, which again, from an inner source commons, like that, that's kind of how that works. It's the, the mechanisms in place about how you manage something like that. 
but now it's in. So if we look at where it's been deployed to, and Neuroform have been involved in most of these. So it's uh, Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Jersey, Gibraltar, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and others to come. And that's one of the benefits from this in that we made this investment and figured out how to solve this problem that many people have. And now we're benefiting from the fact that other people are coming on board and we can see that the flow in the other direction now where the, in the next release that we've got, we're integrating features in that were designed somewhere else and we're bringing that back into what we've done. So I think that's going to be, it's a critical piece that it, it doesn't seem to make any sense. And if you're a policymaker who has no exposure to this, it's very difficult to believe that this can happen, but now we have evidence to show it happening. And Tim has a similar experience with things like this in policing and beforehand, where you do get that sharing and you do see that community building around it. Yeah, and I, you know, from my personal perspective, like when I, I remember seeing that going in, you know, being open sourced, and I remember the first pull request that we saw being put against that was was something along the lines of, you guys don't know how to spell carcivine, I'm down in the west co coast of Ireland, and I, I know we spell it this way. And I remember thinking how wonderful that was that people were taking it, you know, feeling like this was something that was theirs, and therefore community folks from the community, not necessarily developers at all, um, you know, taking action to make that more relevant for them. And for me, that's a primary, you know, benefit of, of open source that people can make it feel that it's their own, which really helps in terms of adoption. And I know, Denise, you've experienced this for years um, and, yeah. and you, you helped um, Nearform on, on their journey around this. Um, perhaps you can talk as well about the, the considerations from Nearform's perspective, being a small uh, you know, uh, company in Ireland and how they chose to take this approach. Sure. I, I think Gar probably remembers the first conversation we had about open sourcing this code base and me saying it's not just about showing the code and that there's a potential for this to actually become the world's solution to contact tracing if we play our cards right. And I remember Carr going, yeah, sure. You know, right? And yet that's what happens if you, if you surf the wave just perfectly, you know. And again, it's important to remember we were not the only contact tracing app that was in progress. We just got lucky that the lessons that came right before us and people being generous and sharing what they were learning made it possible for us to land a little bit better. And, and um, you know, we were just lucky in that. So Nearform, classic, you know, consulting thing for them. They're, they specialize in rapid deployment and uh, they did that. They, the first version, the first working version was done in less than, what was it, 72 hours or something ridiculous like that. And they did full, uh, three full implementations because the target kept changing. It started out as a centralized app and later it became decentralized, but it was always privacy first from its design. Um, there was a lot of real time effort going into creating the game, which is the the APIs that Google and Apple exposed for us so that we could do exposure notification um, because we were sort of pushing the envelope on, on how, you, how, you, how much you can say without actually breaching somebody's privacy, right? And so that was also a factor in how it came out the way it did and why we were positioned where we were in time. But then there came the time where the HSC had published the code to make it interesting to privacy people to have a look at it and they did, and they liked it, and that was great. Um, and a little bit of open source happened, I believe, where they made some suggestions that we took on board, and that creates more trust, more ownership, right? So that when it was released to the public, they were actually advocates for people to pick it up and use it instead of saying, don't, don't do this, it's terrible, the government wrote it. They were all like, yeah, you should use this, right? Which is great. But then the opportunity to give it to the Linux Foundation comes through, and Nearform has to look at the commercial implications, right? So we are selling into markets that want their own special version of that app for their market, like New York. But at the same time, there's only 120 of us. It's not like we can do all the business that's going to come out of this. And at some point, there's there's got to be a humanitarian aspect to your thinking. You know, part of open source is do not try to monetize every value you create. Leave something on the table. If it's possible for us to help the world to a faster solution as this pandemic works its way through the developing world, then that's going to help all of us. 
because a pandemic implies the whole world is at risk. That means we're at risk equally to everybody else. So if we can contribute to the solution, that's a good thing. And um, to be fair, nobody knew who Nearform was outside of Ireland until this tracing app. So the other thing it did was it was a springboard for awareness about the company and its capabilities. So, so we did that calculation and came up with, yes, it should go there. And um, HSE was also amenable to that happening. So we went forward and I, it is the most adopted COVID tracing app now because of that work. And I think, you know, we talked earlier about the importance of how open sourcing that code for the app helped trust in terms of adoption. But actually, what's interesting, I think, from your story is that, it, you know, it's pretty obvious that that, that can also help trust in the organization that created it. And in this case, from a near forms perspective, as they as they were looking to do business in new markets where they weren't known, people could actually see what they had done before and, and therefore trust their capability more, um, which yeah. I think is incredibly important point when we start thinking about, you know, companies from Ireland who are trying to access new markets abroad. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very important point to note. So Well, they keep you. having to remember that the whole world can see mm -hmm. the code. And so that is a driver for pushing features as they're completed on a given version into the upstream version. Right. Yeah. And, and it's not natural, doesn't come natural to a consulting company to do that, even one that really knows a lot about open source. So that's been very interesting to watch. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a fantastic story. Um, but so from, from our perspective, I know we, we've been working with an organization, Moss Labs, which has been uh, working with municipalities and universities on a worldwide basis, helping them create and, and sustain their open source program office. So perhaps you can also comment about that initiative and the, I suppose, the opportunity for open source program office to help in the kinds of things we've been hearing about here today. Um, so when we think about Ireland's potential moving forward in the open source world, we've got these great examples. Um, we're a little bit not coordinated about how we actually go about open source in Ireland, but maybe, maybe you can share with us what you see as being the opportunities um, for us to actually help kind of, I suppose, catapult this forward. Sure. So the idea that Moss Labs has of promoting the, the construct of an OSPO or open source program office into academia and government has to do partially with the fact that this works very well in tech companies and has for 20 years now. I actually started the first OSPO when I was at Sun um, and that was about controlling the influx and outflow of open source. At the time, there was a lot of paranoia in all companies about how that was going to happen. But over time, we've relaxed about that. It's now an underpinning, a strong underpinning of all innovation in the tech sector. And looking at places where there isn't very deep adoption yet, and there probably should be, two of those are academia and municipal governments. And there's been some experimentation, but early adopters were punished for their early adoption and that creates a chilling effect on future adoption. There are a couple of really famous stories like MIT's open coursework that's made them very successful at being the premier tr you know, translation engine, if you will. But there are bigger universities, more, more involved research institutions that really have barely been touching the surface of this kind of sharing of information. So the idea is that we, through Moss Labs, we established working groups and created essentially some course materials for people that are gonna to contribute to the working groups to get everybody working in the same direction of creating an actual network, that's the plus plus, a network of these institutional OSPOs for government and academia around the world and see if we can't meet in the middle a little bit at pulling those two kinds of institutions into open source a little more fully. And um, it's, it's been very interesting and rewarding work. We've been at it for a couple of years now and it's starting to really start to show some fruit. So that's exciting. That's fantastic. And I know, Gar, you know, we, we have spoken about the, the potential to, I suppose, help uh, do more of what you've done with the COVID app in Ireland. Um, so can you maybe comment, and you're on mute at the moment, I'll just note that, but can you maybe comment about, um, you know, your, your thoughts around a construct like this and, and, and whether or not you think that could help, I suppose? 
So, uh, and again, this is, uh, so this is me talking as me rather than me talking for the HSE. Um, so I, I've done a lot of public sector work over the years, and I think I can, I can speak in general about some of that stuff. And specifically with relation, actually, if I start specifically with relation to COVID tracker. So what we're seeing now is the adoption from other, by other countries and other states and other health authorities of this app. And the coordination around that, what we do and how we manage that is turning it, it turns into something. So I, I'm learning as I go along. So I'm learning how, as I have how to do this, but how to build that as an institutional capability within an organization, that's a different thing. It's, it's all well and good having somebody who knows how to navigate this and somebody who knows how to actually engage and go and do it. But trying to build that as a capability in an organization is a different thing. So I think that's the first piece where uh, you end up, and what seems to happen is you end up with individuals where you've got key person dependencies on people who are the glue in this. And I think that's part of where this can fit, where an OSPO can fit, because it is the interface into these worlds. And they're not, it's not their, like they're simple worlds. They're, they're actually quite complex worlds that we're trying to figure it out. And we're trying to figure out who. And Tim has spent a long time trying to figure out who and where and how and how to work with that. I've spent time, and particularly in this one, I've spent time trying to figure out who and what do we do? How do we contribute? What, what does that mean? And there's kind of a laddering up of like, so there's one thing where it's just saying sharing. There's another piece where you're actively contributing, which is a different thing. And there's kind of levels to this as well as we begin to ladder up as we go through the process of understanding how it works. If you look across uh, just problem spaces across public services or municipalities, a lot of similar issues uh, just occur and, and result from the fact that we're trying to solve problems with very narrow um, option sets. So we're trying to solve problems and we, so I, I can only solve it with the tools that I have in front of me or the options I have in front of me. And this just is another way of opening up that, opening up that option space and getting more people involved in it and being able to have those conversations. And equally, the conversations that have happened with other public health authorities about how you do it. And it's not just directly to do with the software. It's, and so we have conversations now with, um, so how are you dealing with schools? So it's nothing to do with the app, but it's how are you dealing with schools? The app is in the background, but how are you dealing with schools? How are you dealing with healthcare workers? How are you dealing with other things like this? So the community begins to kind of become more mature. And as the relationships build, you really benefit, I think, a huge amount. So I think there's, there's a great case to be made, certainly within health services in Ireland, but I also think within broad, more broadly within government in Ireland as to how this can fit and how it can help. So it's not like it's a, it's not another silver bullet. We've had enough silver bullets for now, but it's another tool in the toolbox that we can use. And where it fits, it fits. And when we're trying to do things like this, and we're, we're, when we're trying to solve complex problems, it is that shared collective piece of trying to make sense of something like this, which is what happened in COVID Tracker purely because the urgency was there to drive that. But I don't think there's another mechanism that would allow that to happen. I don't think individual commercial engagements, we narrow too quickly on committing to single options, whereas this allows you to keep your options open for longer and then make decisions later. So, I mean, it's, it's really interesting because we, we talk about open source code and people think focus in on the code and the legal aspects and all the rest of it. But in the open source world, they speak so much about standing on the shoulders of giants. But what I'm hearing is that's not just in the context of the reusability of the code. It's also in this open approach that allows you to share so much more about the cultural stuff around that to make change happen. Um, and even just knowing where to go to find out people who've done it before and to be able to access, you know, those those people. I mean, you know, you know, the conversations between yourself and Tim. One would hope that 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 sort of cross government collaboration, or even Tim, in your experience, cross government, as in cross national border collaboration, uh, should become easier with these kind of constructs. Would you Would you agree, Tim, or or, or oh, how do you see it as, as being a tool? Absolutely. I think the challenge, you know, when certainly if I talk to the technical team or the technical team I used to work with in a previous life, you know, a lot of their training was in a completely different platforms and they read open source and they have the fear that we're going to have to submit code. And they're saying, no, if we can submit the stories about our use, it's probably going to be a way more value to other people than committing code and lines of code. If we don't have those skills, it doesn't mean you should stay away, but it means that me telling a story about how we're using, like the Garda College is using Moodle, and we've moved all of our courses online in the last six months from from physical coursework to virtual coursework. And as we've adopted Moodle, we've just upgraded to the latest version. But 
the fact that we're doing it should allow somebody else to go, oh, I must talk to them about how this works. And we can share absolutely our stories. And I think that's, that's the power that we have. You know, like I'll, I'll never be able to write a line of code that anyone will use, but somebody might take one of my, one of my slide decks. Well, you've got great stories. So I'm, I'm glad to hear you'll continue to share those. So that's fantastic. Oh, yeah. And Brian, Brian, you, you've, you've also been involved in the OSPO++ working group and network um, that Denise was talking about. Um, but can you maybe talk about what you got from that um, from Aliro's perspective? Sure. So uh, actually, we've just established a Lero Open Source Program Office. Uh, and that's just last week. In fact, we had a, a meeting about it. So Lero actually is multi-institutional. We comprise about 300, more than 300 researchers across 12 institutions. So we learned a lot last week about the open source activities across those institutions that we didn't know about. So there's a lot of code being generated in different projects. Uh, we also have a co-founder of the Journal of Open Source Software, which is specifically for open source software being created and uh, being reviewed. Uh, and there, then it became obvious that people had concerns. So they were unaware of what license to use, for example, or how to build a community around their project, which would uh, prevent it from flourishing. And that's where I think the open source spirit came to the fore, for example. So we are getting help from other university OSPOs, uh, Johns Hopkins, who are very sophisticated, Rochester Institute of Technology, University of California, Santa Cruz. So they're all making available to us their lessons, which is typical of the open source spirit that you, uh, Tim talked about the stories that worked and so on. So that inspires other people hearing about things. Uh, we're very excited about semesters of code where we, you know, we send undergraduate students out to companies uh, in their third year for nine months. Uh, the, we think there's a really good opportunity to spend that semester developing open source software, learning about licensing, learning about community contributions, uh, and uh, that would be a useful skill set, which companies would appreciate as well. So that was an idea we didn't have a week ago. Uh, so lots of exciting things. Uh, so watch this space, I guess. I think we'll have a lot of uh, announcements around uh, doing this as Nero. So I, I think it's it's fantastic. I mean, even just to have that gathering space for, or that space for people to gather to share those stories um, is something that the the OSPO can provide. And then the notion that by working across national borders with other institutions that have similar challenges, how much you can learn from that is, is, is incredible. So again, I love the idea that this is just another tool in our toolbox in, in Ireland when we think about innovation and, and how, we, how we just make this happen and more quickly and, 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 and to have other options for people alongside the traditional option of, of IP, for example, monetization, which, which I, it, again, it's just a, an alternative viewpoint on this. Um, Denise, do you maybe want to talk about the OSPO++ network and um, you know, how, how people can get involved in this and what's happening there? Sure. So uh, as I said before, we spent the summer building coursework to help people onboard because every time a new entity joined the conversation, we were having to go back to first principles. So we've, we've built uh, a series of six videos um, that you can watch and kind of get a leg up on where we're at in the conversation. And there's going to be a big push now in the fall to bring... Um, Europe online because we, this all started in America, but uh, with the addition of Lira, we start getting into European entities. Um, the European Commission and, and European Union are getting ready to make some actual concrete uh, policy recommendations and also best practices for member states and companies in, in Europe. And so it's a great time for sort of open source 2.0 awareness to be flooding into to Europe. Not that Europe hasn't been doing plenty of great work. They have, of course. But as a, as a sort of class of service, again, academia and municipalities have been sort of lagging behind in their adoption worldwide, not, not just in Europe. And so we're getting ready to do that big push. So there is a working group. If you represent a research institution uh, in academia, or a municipality, you can certainly apply to join the working group. Um, and I'm not sure, do we have an email address for that appeal? It seems like we should have one. We can absolutely. Uh, if people would like to email info at mosslabs.io, um, they'll be able to find out more information. Perfect, that way. thank you. 
And I think one, one extra thing, one, one thing that I certainly would love to, to just share here today is, is the example for me that really kind of pointed to the power of, of this uh, construct as, as a tool for that collaboration. And that, that's the story of Paris and Lutece and how wow. that managed to pop the Atlantic and be used in Baltimore. Because for me, that was one of the, the most amazing stories of open source at a city level that was able to be applied in a different city, but then also Johns Hopkins and how that became involved in that. So it might be interesting to share that. Um, sure. As a wonderful, yeah. Yeah, so um, the city, this all started because the guy who founded Moss Labs, Jacob uh, Green, who lives in Baltimore, was looking for solutions to try to help his city get better because they were going through a, a rough patch. They were the murder capital of America a couple of years ago. And um, he and others wanted to see that change. Now, local government in Baltimore was also having a crisis. And um, Johns Hopkins, which is the largest uh, in terms of money that it raises, a uh, research institution in America, is headquartered and lives in Baltimore and therefore hires most of its you know, staff from around Baltimore. And they, as the largest um, private in, uh, employer, we're also interested in lifting the municipality. So they got interested through Jacob in this project that he found out about at the city, that the city of Paris had written. Uh, Lutes, which is the old name for, the, for Paris, is an open source, massive actually, open source installation of tools to allow the municipality of Paris to serve its citizenry. So pretty much anything you want to do that touches the city, you have to go through this piece of software, you know, to get a marriage license, to get a building permit, to um, report a pothole in your street. I mean, literally anything. And um, Jacob got very interested in this project and brought it back to Baltimore and through Johns Hopkins, they've built a competency in how to use it. And the first place that they've used it is in the, not at the government level, because the government's still trying to write itself, but um, at the actual institution of fam uh, neighborhood centers, all throughout this little town of Baltimore, there are these neighborhood centers. They're like parish halls almost. And they serve the underserved. They serve the kids who don't have parents at home after school because they're at work. They serve um, the older people that are trying to understand technology and how to, how to navigate the world now. And so now all of your scheduling for those services is going through an instance of Lutes that was created by Johns Hopkins for the neighborhood centers. And that's starting to grow. It's starting to snowball a little bit in that part of America. This is becoming more and more common. And how great is that? And then they contribute back to Lutes and, and these people in Paris are starting to get you know, contributions back from completely new source. They're looking for more of that. So that, for people that are watching this that are in a municipality, by all means, go have a look at Lutes and maybe talk to Moss Labs if you want to understand how to make use of it. And, and I'll add to that, that I, I was uh, listening to the founders of um, Hack Baltimore alongside some of the folks from St. Francis Neighborhood Center at uh, Open Baltimore, uh, the event that they had uh, uh, a little while ago. Um, and they, again, made the point about the fact that this technology is open source, created this level of trust um, yeah. and allowed the people of Baltimore to feel like they had agency in, in the technology that was uh, being made for them. And that instead of technology being done for them, it was being done with them. Um, mm -hmm. And I think when we think about digital transformation and we think about the, that as being a priority for most of the countries around the world, um, that becomes so important, that, le that higher level of trust and, and that that accessibility really uh, and paths to, to get engaged with technology um, is a fantastic thing. There, so, is, a, there is a session um, during this, we're, we're recording this for the Linux Foundation Open Source Summit. And there is a session being recorded for the summit um, where myself and Jacob are talking to Neja, who is the CIO of the city of Paris. So there'll be more information about that there. So I think that's fantastic. Um, and I suppose it's, it's, I'm sorry that we're not all here at the Linux Foundation Open Source Summit, which was due to be held in Dublin, Ireland. Dublin. 
Um, and uh, it's a shame that we can't be all together in person um, to have those discussions, but it's wonderful um, that we can share these experiences and share these stories um, regardless. So, and hopefully to an even wider audience, which, which is marvelous. Um, before we wrap up, would anyone like to care to make any final kind of comments or observations about, the, um, about open source and how it can be used in national innovation agendas? Or even what's next in the future? Maybe, maybe I'll just ask everyone what they think is next for them in the open source world. So Gar, I'll start with you. Where, where, where are you going to next when, on your open source journey? So uh, I think for us, I, I think there's, there's an interesting community that has just grown up within the Linux Foundation Public Health Project. And I think the, it's now looking in adjacent spaces. So it's not, it's not necessarily, so the app is a thing, but all of the adjacent spaces to do with a pandemic response are the places where the conversations are beginning to go. And that's where a lot of the efforts are going, the thinking is going. It's what else do we need to do? How else do we support and help through this? So I think that's, for me, that, that's the next area. It's the next thing there. I think there will be an ongoing evolution with these contact tracing based technologies and that's gonna happen. And there's a great community to be able to share within that. And the EU interoperability work that's happening at the moment is all being coordinated through the Linux Foundation Public Health Slack channel that's literally just sitting on top of it. It doesn't really have anything directly to do with it, but it's just, just because the community had convened there, it's a convenient place to bring those people together to coordinate some of the activity that's going on. So that's within the very short term, but I think longer term, it's really those adjacent spaces that we'll begin to explore more. Thanks, thanks, Gar. Um, Brian, from your perspective, I know the Lero Ospo is in its early days, but what are oh. the next steps from your perspective? So, so it, open source is very in, interesting. I think like, I thought it wouldn't work because it's so paradoxical. But things like crowdsourcing, which have been very popular in many areas in the past few years, in medical research, for example, uh, pharmaceutical research, the only reason that happened was because of the success of open source, that you could now do things like that. So the open star for us is where this is really interesting, like open hardware is there, open data is really important, open innovation. So all those things are enabled by... Uh, by open source, the success of open source, that example are proving that you could harness millions of people. I think Linux project is described as the largest collab collaborative project in the history of mankind. So you have those kinds of things that couldn't happen before. So it opens all kinds of new research areas, which we're very excited about. Well, that sounds like an interesting path for, for you guys to, to, to be starting on, so fantastic. Um, and Tim, from your perspective, what, what are the next steps from the open source agenda? I think yeah, that I think no no different from my colleagues. I, the plan is just to to keep pushing the rocks up the hill, um, and keep telling stories. I think certainly we're looking to share with our colleagues across different policing organisations, and harness their their thoughts and their powers. They're they're possibly ahead of us on the journey in terms of policing, but we're in the same space in terms of technology. So. Um, I think uh, the, the future is bright. And uh, when I get my, my innovation room going in, in Garda Sheikhana, we'll invite the world to come in and look. Fantastic. Oh. Yeah, I love that. And, and hope, hopefully we might, uh, we might see about how we could actually gather together all this energy and, and hopefully do more. I, I'll note that um, the Open Source Observatory did a report recently in terms of Ireland and uh, you know, the constructs and institutions that were available to support open source. And they did note that as of today, we don't necessarily have a, a, a formal strategy around open source. But I think from all the stories we've heard here today, it just seems like there is so much potential for Ireland in this space um, in terms of accelerating innovation, looking at skills that are, are, are uh, required for the worldwide software ecosystem, um, thinking about how Ireland can play its part in addressing these global problems that are emerging for us. So um, I certainly look forward to thinking about how a construct like the OSPO and the OSPO plus, plus 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 Network can help us on that journey. So I'd like to close out today then by saying thank you all for your participation. And um, I very much look forward to taking this, this conversation further. So thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah,